Croiso friends, once again, I'm back with another clothing project. My local SCA Barony has its annual Arts and Sciences event very soon, and this year the theme is Italian Renaissance. I don't always dress to match the time and place of a given event, especially when it's so far outside of the scope of my own personal preferences. However, this theme gives me the opportunity to indulge in one of my other interests, the modular wardrobe. Because people in ye olden days had far less clothing than we have the opportunity to own today, and because ye modern closet has limited space in it, I enjoy exploring ways to use accessories and small alterations to create several different looks with one large article of clothing. In this particular case, I wanted to take the kirtle that I made as the base for a working class Tudor outfit and have also worn very successfully with a late Elizabethan slash early Jacobian fitted jacket and see if I could turn it into a passingly successful Italian Renaissance gown. Renaissance Italy was a collection of individual city-states, each with its own government and customs and sartorial trends. So something you might see in the late 1400s in Genoa would be different from what you'd see in the same time period in Venice, and both would be different from what you'd see in Florence. Looking at the working class women in the paintings of artist Vincenzo Campi, the things that stood out to me as quintessentially Florentine are as follows. One, poofy oversized sleeves, at least compared to Tudor working class women. These sleeves tend to be tied or pinned to the kirtle shoulders and are often a different color from the main garment. Two, contrasting guards on the main body of the kirtle, especially around the neckline. Sometimes two, but always at least one stripe and also sometimes on the skirts as well. Often black, but sometimes a dark contrasting color, for example, dark red on this green dress. A flat waistline along the front. I will have to disguise the point of my Tudor-style kirtle with an apron or girdle, but don't worry, I already have ideas. Okay friends, grab your current project and your favorite cuppa, and let's get into it. Okay, if you think about a commercial sleeve pattern, which is to say, narrow at the bottom, wide at the top of the arm, with the arm side bump of the shoulder in the middle here. This is what you see in most commercial patterns. But if you take one part of the underarm and put it on the other side, that gives us a wide at the top, narrow at the bottom, with the shoulder to one side of the sleeve. This moves the seam back to the back of the arm and is much more what you would see in most medieval sleeve patterns. So if I take that basic shape and add width to the top, length to the bottom, and make it poofy on the sides, this is going to give me a shape that's much more in keeping with my envisioning of a Florentine sleeve pattern and that's where you would put the tie point up at the top. Okay, what I'm doing here is I've taken an old coat hardy or gothic fitted dress sleeve pattern that I drafted about 10 years ago and I'm using that as a basis for my Florentine sleeve pattern. It's already had the seam rotated to the back of the arm, which gives the top of the sleeve that lovely sine wave shape. I'm just double checking my wrist width here to make sure that the sleeve is going to fit me. I've measured the length already, and now I'm just creating the basic sleeve shape to use as a base for the Florentine shape. With the basic sleeve shape done, I can start drafting my Florentine sleeves on this lovely piece of blue-green linen. I generally prefer using pattern weights instead of pins as it allows me to be a little bit more flexible. And as you see, I have the material doubled, so I'm really cutting out both sets of sleeves instead of just one at a time. Double checking here how wide I want the sleeves to be at the widest part and that will also influence exactly how wide the top of the sleeve arm side will be. Added a little bit of length here as well. 
I do still want to be able to work in these sleeves during the day, so I want them to be poofy but not balloony. And with the sleeves all drafted up, now I can go ahead and cut them, adding a seam allowance at the bottom to make sure that I have exactly as much length as I want. Now that the sleeves are cut, I'm just double checking that everything lines up from side to side. And since that looks good, I can go ahead and use the linen sleeves as a pattern to cut out the silk fabric. to get out my pin cushion and pin the sleeves together. From here on out, I will be showing what I do to one sleeve, but not both, as showing both would make this video insufferably long. I do like to make sure that I'm folding the sleeves correctly. When all is said and done, if I put them next to each other, they should form mirror images as shown right there. After that, it's just a matter of making sure the sides line up together and that I'm pinning in a consistent direction which will make it easy for me to take them out as I sew them on my machine. Since this is just a relatively gentle curve, I am only putting pins in about every two to three inches. All four sleeves are now pinned in the correct mirror image configuration and I am just about ready to take things back over to my machine so I can get sewing. Normally I would use a matching rather than contrasting thread color, but since none of this machine sewing is going to be seen from the outside, I figured it didn't matter that much. And at least this way you get to see the line of my sewing when I'm actually doing it. I'm using a half inch seam allowance here, which is less than the commercially standard 5 eighths of an inch. And now it's time for the linen sleeves. Note that I am not sewing over any of the pins. I am removing them as I get to them. I've sewn over and broken too many. Even though the sleeve curve is pretty gentle, I'm still clipping the seam allowance. That way when I go to iron the sleeves, they will end up laying a little bit more flat. Readjusting my iron for a silk setting. Always make sure to have your iron on the correct setting for the material you are pressing, lest disaster befall you. Now that all four sleeve sections have been sewn up, it's time to attach the silk to the linen sleeves. Off we go. What I will be doing in this section is attaching the silk inner sleeve to the linen outer sleeve. I'll start this process by turning the silk sleeves inside out. I then make sure that the sleeves match each other. Same curves with the same curves. 
and that the seams are on the same side of each sleeve. Once that is established, I put the linen sleeve inside the silk sleeve, making sure that the right sides of each sleeve are facing each other and that the seam is lined up. Then I will pin around the arm side of each sleeve. I notice that there is a little discrepancy right there that I will go ahead and cut off each sleeve. Once that's all squared up nicely, it's time to go back to the sewing machine and sew up these arm size. Once those are all sewn up, it's time to come back to my table and clip all of these curves. This lets the seam allowance expand and contract above the seam line in ways that when you press it makes for a very smooth curve. turn the sleeves right side out, tucking the linen lining back into the silk so that I can then press the tops of the arm side. Back at the pressing station, I'm using a kind of pinching and rolling technique to make sure that the seam is as turned out as possible before I press it. Little bit of judicious steam use here makes sure that the pressed seam is nice and crisp. You can see here how nice and sharp that pressed edge is, especially in comparison with this edge that I haven't pressed yet. I don't want any visible machine stitching, so in order to finish up these wrist edges of the sleeves, I will be folding each raw edge in by about half an inch. I'll pin the hems of the sleeve and lining separately, and then pin both materials together at the end. This allows for a very precise hem on both sides, which is what I want in a reversible sleeve. I start by making sure that the sleeve seams are lined up with each other. having to ease some extra stretchier linen into the less forgiving silk sleeve, but it will all work out in the end. All finished and ready for hand sewing. 
gathering up my materials, which in general are usually a needle. This particular one is from a set of Japanese sharps that I completely adore. A small pair of scissors, my pincushion, brass pins from Burnley and Trowbridge, sometimes beeswax for thread conditioning, and of course, thread. The thread I am using is Coates & Clark Heavy Duty in a taupe color that kind of matches the silk. I generally prefer heavy duty thread for areas that could potentially see a lot of strain and wear. The stitch that I am using is sometimes called an invisible stitch or a ladder stitch. It basically consists of taking one running stitch on each alternating side of the hem so that a little ladder of thread is formed, holding the two fabrics together with ideally no thread showing once the ladder is pulled tight. I'll go ahead and zoom you in so you can see it a little bit more clearly as I stitch. Okay, I think you can generally see the process. Take one running stitch on the linen side. And then one running stitch on the silk side, starting where the last running stitch ended. And repeat the process again on the linen side.
finished. Now just to finish the other hem and I will be done with the sleeves. Okay, now that the sleeves are all finished, it's time to move on to the kirtle. Here is the front, and you can see the slight point that is pretty ubiquitously English Tudor, and that will have to be disguised by some kind of sash or apron. I found in my stash a piece of black velvet ribbon that would be perfect. I'm not quite sure it's long enough, but we'll see. It turns out that nope, it's not long enough after all. I have a couple options. I can try to piece the gap in the ribbon or I can use something else completely. This piece of black linen bias tape is a color match, but the texture is too dissimilar, especially since I'm not planning on wearing a veil that could camouflage the difference. I'm resorting to a length of store-bought bias quilt binding. It is in no way historically accurate, but that's honestly okay with me since it's only going to be temporarily attached anyway. I think my favorite part of adding the guards to the neckline is the mitered corners. The secret is to pin the bias tape at the lowest point and then fold the tape up to create a lovely sharp corner and pin it again to hold it in place. Here you can get a quick visual of what that will look like when it's all finished.
Once the pinning is all done, I am going to attach the guard with a felling or applique stitch. Each stitch is about a centimeter apart, give or take, since this is again only meant to be temporarily basted on. I am using a much finer silk thread from Guterman this time, and a fine gauge needle since it's sometimes difficult to sew through this type of bias binding with a thicker, sharp needle. With that, the dress is complete. You can see I wasn't very careful about making sure the stitching was invisible, but since it's temporary, I don't really care. Now it's time to try everything on. friends. 
With very few accessories, I now have a passable Florentine Renaissance gown that can go from working woman to modest courtier in less than 10 minutes. Thank you for coming along with me today. And if you enjoyed this discussion on modular clothing, please tell me in the comments below so I know to make more videos talking about how amazing medieval capsule wardrobes can be. In the meantime, make sure to like and subscribe, and if you want to be notified when I upload new videos, be sure to ring that notification bell. Huil! I'm gonna make it impossible for me to film, aren't you?